Hello there. Uh, this is Dr. Rob Sivas. Uh, on social media, I'm known as the Carb Addiction Doc. And today I'm going to present in a more fleshed out time-based uh, discussion a talk I was recently given the honor of giving at a Swiss Re conference in Zurich, Switzerland. And this is fleshing that out. So up at the top here, you see the Swiss Re logo, and it is quite incredible how uh, they are advancing an agenda. They are a reinsurance company looking at life and health insurance, and they are advancing an agenda of more effective risk evaluation and a better understanding of what risks there are involved in healthcare, in metabolic healthcare, that obviously from a fiscal perspective are going to affect um, their payouts for life insurance. Are you going to die earlier? And how do they evaluate who's more likely to die earlier? And are you going to get sick? Not only are they looking at the risk evaluation, they're also incredible in that they are um, focused on helping people to understand the more effective mechanisms of fixing metabolic illnesses. So in this discussion today, we are going to discuss strategies to fix metabolic health and which are the commonest causes of death in most of this country in most of the world but in order to fix metabolic health we need to understand what the true root cause of metabolic harm is and we'll go through that discussion one of the other very interesting um, uh, things about the Swiss Re conference is that it was co-sponsored by the British Me British Medical Journal which is one of the two or three most preeminent um, medical journals uh, in the world, uh, certainly in the U.S. And I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, in the world, it's not a U.S. based, it's based in, in Britain. However, um, it was really forward thinking to see the editor in chief of the BMJ um, sponsoring and being president of this conference. It tells us that we are on the right pathway when we are looking at metabolic health the way we're describing it today. Um, Metabolic health is a new specialty. We're a fledgling specialty. And I know this is a busy slide, but I put the slide together to represent to you anybody working in the healthcare space to understand what the next five to 10 years of the healthcare industry looks like. Um, I am Dr. Robert Sivas, and I consider myself, even though I've evolved um, as a surgeon, I consider myself to be a fledgling metabolic health specialist. Um, as such, if you look uh, at the bottom corner over here, this is my practice. And my little mom and pop shop, uh, JSAPA, um, practices metabolic health uh, all the way from conservative care, conservative care to medication all the way through to surgery because I am a board certified adult and pediatric surgeon. If, just as a, a little plug, if you're interested in a consult, if you're interested in speaking to me about how to train in metabolic health, um, text us, WhatsApp us, call us at 561-517-0642. Uh, certainly in my office for my patients, we do um, initial visits, we manage patients. Um, we also get blood work and coronary artery calcium scores, and we have a, a keto diabetic dietitian as well as a psychologist on staff to help in the transition. And what you're going to hear today in part is our management philosophy, our management process, how we manage patients in a metabolic specialty office. Uh, further over the last decade or two, um, our specialty has evolved in that we now have established a specialty society. The Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners was established a few years ago. And it is a representative organization like other specialty organizations that is a collection of health practitioners who work in this field. Um, we have an education program, uh, a training program where you can get certified, run through the Nutrition Network, uh, which comes out of the Noakes Foundation in South Africa, but it is an international uh, organization. And they've trained several thousand physicians and allied healthcare workers all over the world that are now certified in metabolic uh, health. Um, furthermore, 62 authors got together with Tim Noakes uh, as the editor, and we have written the first ever specific peer-reviewed reference textbook called Ketogenic, uh, the Science of Therapeutic Carbohydrate Restriction in Human Health. And that textbook legitimizes a lot of what I'm about to say today and what other people in my space talk about because 
Um, so often we get criticized. Oh, it's not peer reviewed. Oh, you don't have studies. Well, I spent more time doing my hundreds of references for this, for the book chapters I wrote. I wrote three chapters. Um, then I actually wrote, spent time writing the chapter. This book is heavily referenced with peer reviewed articles. There is no ability for anybody in a, an objective way to make a statement that therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, that metabolic health is not um, peer reviewed and not science based. That journal contains everything you need. And then um, the next step that we did as part of SMHP is we said one of the things we need is a place to publish our, our journals, a, a, a journal to publish our peer reviewed work. And as such, we took the Journal of Insulin Resistance and we have now converted that to become the Journal of Metabolic Health. And the Journal of Metabolic Health is the official journal for the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. And we can publish peer reviewed articles, peer reviewed science based papers in that journal that all pertain to metabolic health uh, as a specialty. And you can see that we're coming together. The final piece that we were missing is a collective. And um, a year or two ago, we initiated a company called Global Health Quest. And more and more healthcare has become an industry where physicians like myself are less and less likely to be mom and pop in private practice. Um, and we are becoming part of a collective. And what Global Health Quest offers us is two opportunities. Number one, the ability to be employed uh, worldwide. This is a worldwide organization employed worldwide under a single hat. And the beauty there is that Global Health Quest takes care, care of administration, takes care of the logistics, takes care of the things that don't involve doctoring, but so often people like myself end up having to do so that we can focus on the healthcare. They are also a network of metabolic specialists that can inter-refer, talk to each other and advance the science of metabolic health. Secondly, you can partner with Global Health Quest and say, look, I'm in my own practice, but I'd like to be able to share in these patients. I am metabolically health trained. Um, I'd like to work with these patients, whether I'm in India, or Kuala Lumpur or Australia or America or the UK or Poland. It doesn't matter what country you're in. Um, the employed physicians can then partner with local physicians in different communities who are trained, who um, have a buy-in and a, an experience in this field. And we can then work alongside with you, not taking patients away from you, but helping you to benefit your patients better. Um, we also have obviously a, um, a paradigm of eating and we will go into this uh, paradigm of eating. It certainly is the content of most of most of my social media. And I'm present, as you've seen on YouTube, uh, on, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok. We put our content out there to share this with the world, to educate the world. Um, but we have taken the standard American diet food pyramid or food plate, turned it upside down and also added in a very large psychologic component um, because a large part of metabolic health is not a nutritional problem. It is a substance abuse mental health problem. Think about that, folks. And we'll talk about that. But if you don't practice, I hate to use the word holistic. I'm not a holistic practitioner. But if you don't practice in a way that helps the person to transform fundamentally how they approach their life, you are not going to be able to sustain the health improvements and the health changes you make. So correcting health illnesses, correcting correcting metabolic harm, the therapeutic aspect is the first important aspect. But ultimately, if the therapeutic correction is made, it has to be sustained. And you have to have sustain, uh, sustainability methodology built into your program so that the person continues to prevent metabolic harm and stay metabolically healthy for the rest of their lives. So my personal story is that I currently practice in uh, West Palm Beach in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I do have a nonprofit that is our study and education arm, and we have been funded by Dexcom. And some of the data you're going to see in the study is from Dexcom. I'm a founding board member of the SMHP. I am the director of clinical operations for Global Health Quest. I am a lecturer for the, Nutri uh, for the Nutrition Network and a co-author of the textbook. And we are also doing a number of trials and studies 
um, in uh, the space, and you'll see some of those uh, as part of this talk. So let's dive into this. What happened? What, because metabolic health, why is it a new specialty? Uh, why has it not uh, been around forever? And the reason for that is it really wasn't needed to be around for, for a long, long time. What has happened is that industry, in defense of certain harmful products, and I, I'll just throw three out there, tobacco, nicotine, sugar-sweetened beverages, and um, fluoride. Fluoride in our drinking water. Uh, those are three things. You'll see them on my channel. Those are three areas where industry has defended those products or their uh, uh, the products that cause metabolic harm and have altered our thinking uh, in very nefarious ways to change how we think of health. And uh, we'll discuss some of that as we go through this discussion. However, one of the other things that we did as physicians, as people practicing in the healthcare space, in the 1990s, the concept of science that I grew up with in the 70s and 80s when I was training was a physiology-based uh, understanding of healthcare, where we looked at healthcare process, at pathways by which health happens and by which pathophysiologically disease happens. So we understood the steps, um, but in the 1990s, an intentional training change was made at our universities, certainly here in the US, and science shifted away from a causal physiologic understanding of health and disease toward an outcomes-based, epidemiologically-based uh, foundation of healthcare. And what epidemiology does is it doesn't look at causal pathways. It looks at observational associations. And by definition, epidemiology can never be causal. They can say strong or weak associations, but they can never be causal. And therefore, a lot of confounding things come in. And I'll just give you a, a simple example of how this works. When you look at epidemiologic observational data, they will tell you quite happily that any form of caloric reduction, any form of caloric reduction reduces weight. And that is absolutely true. Okay, Whether you're on the cookie diet or the carnivore diet, all diets result in transient weight loss. That is absolutely true as an association. However, it doesn't address why you gained the weight in the first place. Then the epidemiologic folks go on to make another association. So they see caloric reduction results in weight loss. And if you have diabetes associated with your weight loss, when you lose weight, when you reduce your calories, your diabetes metrics improve. So through that pathway of association, if you flip it around and you erroneously assign cause, you're not going to say that weight gain causes diabetes because weight loss improves diabetes. And that is a logical association that is completely false. So epidemiology has trained physicians to perhaps make erroneous associations or true associations, but to treat the consequence of a problem rather than the cause of a problem and think they're, tre they're treating the cause. So we treat the obesity, we see the improvement of the diabetes, but both the obesity and the diabetes are consequences of something that these folks don't understand. And then we create a whole paradigm. So we create thousands of different diets and we do all these studies that compare them and any study comparing diets people are going to lose weight and that's what confounds us so if you're on a carnivore diet oh i'm not eating carbohydrates it must be better we're evangelical it's not better it's not better it's not better when it comes to weight loss they're all about the same there are minor nuances but they're all about the same uh then when people start to gain the weight back or they're struggling we add in other things we add in appetite suppression fentamine or we say you know what i don't want to go on a diet i'm just going to use an outsource to a monotherapy with a drug so now we're using glp1s the ozempics and that kind of thing the new drugs on the horizon are the triple g's um, which are combination incretin drugs and all of these medications work in the epidemiologic studies that are published they all have transient significant weight loss and certainly bariatric surgery obesity surgery is overwhelmingly the most effective intervention for weight loss absolutely so 
in line, these three things all result in weight loss. Um, but the leap, the intellectual leap that people then make is if all of these things improve weight, they should then get rid of diabetes and they do improve diabetes. However, they do not give us the answer as to why the big patient became obese or diabetic in the first place. And if you don't understand the root cause, long-term sustainable efficacy is just not possible. So what does physiology do? How is that different from epi? Physiology looks at why we gained the weight in the first place. Why did we become metabolically unhealthy? So yes, absolutely. We need to have those first three interventions to help us to reverse the disease. But we also have to understand the root cause and treat the root cause towards sustainability. And when we look at physiology, it's pretty, and that's what metabolic health does, it's pretty obvious that the pathway to all of these metabolic, um, uh, metabolic illnesses, the eye of the needle is insulin resistance. And today I'm going to reveal a further concept that comes out of our practice, that insulin resistance is based on genetics. Genetics don't cause insulin resistance, but the consequence of insulin resistance is phenotypically expressed differently based upon your genetics so that some populations may be obesogenic and some may be diabetogenic and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes um, and the problem is that most people working in our space most of the weight loss people uh, most of the endocrinologists prescribing um, incretins for weight loss and for diabetes most bariatric surgeons who are operating on people for weight loss have no clue because we've been raised in the epidemiologic era, and we still continue to blame excess calories and a lack of exercise, calories in, calories out, as the cause of these problems, which is absolutely false. So let's look at the epidemiologic observations, because these are real. And this is a study that was uh, uh, published uh, um, a few years ago, 2018, but it was an epidemiologic observational study. And they looked at calories in, calories out. And what they looked at as population trends happened from 1955 to 2015, they noticed a dramatic increase. So they tracked an increase, this green line, an increase in what they called daily caloric intake. And as our caloric intake massively increased, so did two things in parallel. So did obesity rates, and simultaneously, and that's important, that word simultaneously is important, simultaneously, so did diabetes rates go up. If the epidemiologic observation that obesity causes diabetes was true, then surely we should have seen obesity first and secondarily diabetes. We should, have, we should not have seen them in parallel like this. Hmm. So there's a first clue that maybe the epidemiologic carries in, carries out, obesity causes diabetes is false. Um, the second thing is that if you look at what people were eating, and I've made this correction in this graph, the increase in caloric consumption did not come from an increase in protein. Our protein consumption has been fairly steady. It did not come from an increase in fat consumption. In fact, our fat consumption because of lipophobia went significantly down. It exclusively came from chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. So in fact, this graph, all three lines are a direct reflection of chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption. So remember that there's a clue. And if you look physiologically at the numbers, if you look a little deeper, that is what we're seeing. And everybody in, uh, that's watching this right now has that little aha moment. We can understand that. So the traditional epidemiologic thinking, as I've mentioned, is this tree of life, where a high calorie diet and a lack of exercise, high calorie diet and a lack of exercise leads to weight gain and obesity, and weight gain leads to obesity, and then the obesity causes or is associated with best epidemiology can be, all of these diseases, including diabetes. So they look at this as a sequence, that it's the high calories that cause the obesity that causes all of these diseases, the metabolic harm. And that's epidemiology. 
So therefore, weight loss, if we reverse this, if you lose weight, you're going to resolve all of these health issues. And yes, when we look epidemiologically, we see that trend. But the cause is a problem. And I'll tell you that um, industry, the manufacturing industry of food, has been very, very nefariously supportive of this concept. In fact, you cannot go to a sporting event and not see an advertisement for Coca-Cola products. Why? Because instead of blaming sugar-sweetened beverages for our obesity and our diabetes, Coca-Cola diverted us and said, this is a calorie problem. And if you drink a Coke and go for a run, you're not going to be fat or diabetic. And they've heavily promoted and focused on move more and a lack of exercise as the primary responsible cause of all of this harm to divert away from their sugar sweetened beverages that are causing the problem. So industry has sponsored our healthcare thinking and promulgated that by paying for nefarious studies and nefarious papers that have been published epidemiologically. And those epi papers are supporting an industry-based or perhaps a religion-based agenda that is not healthcare. So when we live and the majority of physicians still have a comprehensive understanding that the problem of all this metabolic harm is calories in, calories out. And if you ate less and exercised more, uh, you would be able to solve all these problems. And we see then bariatric surgery as a final treatment, not only of, of weight loss, but now vicariously bariatric surgeons are looking at bariatric surgery as a final definitive treatment for diabetes. Okay, that's how the thinking has gone. And that, folks, is false thinking, and it may be very harmful. So <clears throat> let's look at what truly happens in the human body. Let's look at physiology, okay? So now we're gonna look <clears throat> at pathways, and this data, folks, it hasn't been published yet. It is in preparation in my office. This is data, and these are observations from within my own office. And um, when we look at people who consume sugar and starch, carbohydrates to excess, who are snacking perpetually so that they have incoming nutrition, usually carbohydrate laden, but even if it isn't, uh, consuming throughout the day instead of allowing an ebb and flow and eating massive excessive quantities. And we see portions, especially in the United States, going up massively. Every time I go to Europe, I kind of get annoyed that they're giving me a kiddies portion. But in fact, that juxtaposes against this massive overburdening quantity that gets put on my plate in US restaurants. And we have become taken binge eating and made that a natural part of how we eat. So the combination of excess carbohydrates, of snacking and of binge eating, and all three of those are part of dysfunctional mental health restitution rather than nutrition. But when we do that over time, when our relationship with food is shifted away from a nutritional foundation toward um, a foundation where we overeat for the emotional benefits for the endorphin relief that we get from our eating pattern, then over time, we strain the body. And excess carbohydrates are toxic in every single space in the body. And as a metabolic specialist, I look at the body in terms of four spaces. The first space is the intestine. So we see irritable bowel, we see reflux, we see inflammatory bowel disease, we even see cancer. We then see um, this food going to the liver, we see fatty liver disease, uh, we see it spilling over into the bloodstream, but at first, at first, the human body is designed um, to have several hormonal methodologies to protect the body from excess sugar, and the primary driving force there is insulin. So <clears throat> as, your, as you get the sugar into your bloodstream and into the liver, insulin drives that sugar into the cells. And in the muscle cells, our larger cell uh, population, apart from maybe fat cells, um, our muscle cells store that sugar as glycogen. Our liver stores that sugar as glycogen and turns that sugar into fat, triglycerides, that's where we get fatty liver from. And in the fat cells, 
Insulin is a huge driver of de novo lipogenesis in fat cells, so we store that excess sugar as fat and we protect our body from, from sugar, from the damage of sugar, by converting it to fat. So the ability to turn sugar into fat protects the body from the harm of sugar. And that is done over here under the influence of insulin. However, of course, when you flood cells with excess sugar, over time, those cells get harmed. And the way the cells protect themselves from that excessive abundance of sugar entering the cell under the influence of insulin is they progressively begin to block the insulin receptor. They phosphorylate it, they downregulate it, so that you've got fewer receptors and the receptors are dysfunctional. So when insulin binds to that receptor, it can no longer allow sugar into the cell. So blood sugar starts to build up. The sugar starts to build up in the blood vascular space. And this is where genetics comes in. So if you look at this bell curve of humanity, we kind of look at the two opposite sides. Obviously, it's a bell curve. There's a spread and patients live all the way across on the spread. But there is one population who genetically can produce high amounts of insulin. And I measure that in every patient in my office. So when you measure a C-peptide, a fasting C-peptide and a fasting insulin, and you see it's massively elevated, that's going to give you a clue that that person is a high insulin producer. And those people that are very high insulin producers can continue to override insulin resistance and keep forcing the sugar into the liver, into the fat cells, turning that sugar into fat, those people are obesogenic. They may become enormous, but their blood sugars are relatively normal to begin with. At some point, however, everybody becomes insulin resistant to the point that their insulin production capacity is less than their insulin resistance. And at some point, everybody will over time cross over to the other side of this graph. The difference is that some people, the obesogenic population, do that very, very late. So obesity is promulgated by relative, relative normoglycemia or minor hyperglycemia, but massive hyperinsulinemia. So the, the overriding metabolic harm is persistent hyperinsulinemia, high, high persistent levels of insulin with still relatively normal levels of blood sugar, a relatively normal A1C. And <clears throat> the diseases that these people have, obviously obesity. So if you see that enormous person coming in, this is probably their issue. Uh, secondly, they have a, a weight-related joint disease. So lower back, hips, knees, ankles are going to be the joints that they get uh, into trouble with, and it's mostly an osteoarthritis. Um, their risk for dementia, for Alzheimer's disease, significantly increased. Risk of hypertension is increased. Risk of cancer is increased. And these are all insulin effects. So insulin regulates dementia, Alzheimer's. Insulin regulates cancer surveillance. Insulin is responsible for steroid hormone production. So vitamin D levels are going to be low. Uh, the women are going to have polycystic ovarian syndrome with high testosterone, low estrogen, low progesterone. They, the men are going to have low testosterone. Your risk for autoimmune disease goes up significantly. These are the diseases that obesogenic people are going to have. On the flip side, as you become insulin resistant, and particularly if you become insulin resistant early because you are a low insulin producer, now you're going to flip across. You may gain a little bit of weight, but eventually you're going to flip across. And when you become insulin resistant, you can no longer produce excess weight. So we don't become fatter. And we've all met that person who's, oh, I can eat anything I want to. I don't gain weight. That's the person I'm most scared of because that person has what we call TOFI, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And by looking at them, you cannot tell, especially if they're an athlete, that there is metabolic harm, especially if they're an athlete because they look good. However, when you measure their blood work and the blood work you want to measure is their insulin, their C-peptide, their A1C, you'll see, wow, the insulin C-peptide is elevated. They're slightly hyperinsulinemic, but it's not very high. But their blood sugars, their A1Cs are elevated. And in these folks, and they don't necessarily 
have to have an A1C over 6.5. It could be in that 5, 8, 5, 9, 6, 1, 6, 2 category, which is where we've always ignored them. Oh, be careful, drink less Coke because um, you're pre-diabetic. No, you're not. A normal A1C, folks, a normal A1C is 5.2. Why 5.2? I'll show you in a few minutes. But at 5.2, that is the number where your excess sugar in your bloodstream is not a contributor to metabolic harm. So the difference from 5.2 elevated is a measure of harm. And above 5.2, when you get to 5.5, your cardiovascular risk doubles. So what happens in the diabetogenic population is that they are no longer able to clear the sugar into their cells. They're no longer able to gain that excess weight. So the blood sugar builds up and their blood glucose is elevated above about 95 to 100. And it may only be 108, 110, but that is still causing this injury. And these folks eventually go on to develop type 2 diabetes, but more dominantly, they develop cardiovascular disease because sugar is a pro-inflammatory molecule in the blood vessels at higher concentrations. So we get vascular inflammation and a procoagulant environment that triggers the clotting cascade. And the reason that they get plaque disease, atherosclerosis, is based upon chronic vascular inflammation, clot development, and lipids layering down as the final part of the healing process of vascular inflammation. We see that with nicotine consumption in the 50s and 60s, and we see it with sugar consumption. And in fact, in the 1950s and 60s, the tobacco companies, another industry, blamed saturated fat as the cause of vascular injury to absolve the responsibility being placed on smoking and nicotine consumption. Think about that. That is an industry shift. Lipophobia is not science. Lipophobia is an industry-sponsored deflection away from cigarettes. And look at our society, how lipophobic most societies are. Fear of fat. But the diabetogenic folks develop cardiovascular disease, and that's why a coronary artery calcium score, a CT scan looking at the plaque development in blood vessels in this population, should be a fundamental baseline test no different than looking at urine or looking at basic blood work. It should be in the basic armamentarium and every patient, especially in this category, should know their CAC score because it's actionable. And more than 50% of people in America are gonna die of cardiovascular disease. Obviously, along with the cardiovascular disease, the stroke rate goes up tremendously. But not only is your vascular inflammation and hyperglycemia in the vascular space prominent, the sugar also leaches into the interstitial space. And something that I'm a huge advocate of with this group is wearing a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. And what CGMs measure is CGMs measure interstitial blood sugar concentration. That little probe is not sitting in your blood vessels, it's sitting in the space between your blood vessels and your cells where you're measuring the sugar concentration in the interstitium. And so what lives in that interstitial space where your nerves live there, so you get neuronal metaplasia, you get neuropathy from your eyes to your heart, to your gut, to your lungs, to your erectile dysfunction, to your peripheral neuropathy, all the nerves and to your brain, all the nerves are affected by neuropathy. And then we get tendon and ligament injuries. We get fibromyalgia. <clears throat> we get inflammatory joint disease, which is different than the osteoarthritis of weight bearing joint disease. And then finally, because there's a procoagulant environment in our arteries, but also in our veins, we get blood clots. So the diabetogenic population develop cardiovascular atherosclerosis and plaque disease, heart attacks and strokes. They develop arrhythmias that can cause heart attacks and strokes and clots, and they develop venous blood clotting. The obesogenic people have hypertension as well as well as the diabetogenic people, but also a small amount of clotting disorders, uh, venous clotting disorders. So when we look at the therapy, the hyperinsulinemic people, the obesogenic folks, benefit from primary bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery has a primary effect. Certainly weight loss medications have a primary effect uh, in reducing this, and this is where the epidemiologic association comes in. And the lifestyle interventions only have a secondary role. 
When it comes to the hyperglycemic patients, the diabesogenic patients, um, primarily their medications, hypogly hypoglycemic medications, are going to be the most important um, toolkit that physicians can prescribe apart from the lifestyle changes. However, primary lifestyle intervention is crucial for this population as well, the diabetics. And then the bariatric surgery may have a secondary effect mediated by the weight loss. So <clears throat> even your heaviest patients may cross over, and I'll show an example of that in a little bit, but they may cross over, but they are still obesogenic. Bariatric surgery, in my opinion, has no impact on the hyperglycemics. And yet, because of the epidemiologic studies I mentioned earlier on, the bariatric surgeons, and we're going to discuss this in this talk, are favoring bariatric surgery as a primary weapon against diabetes because of erroneous calories in, calories out thinking. Okay, so let's look at this model that I've just looked at here uh, as a result from my office. Let's look at how this functions and how this functions at a cellular level. So in a normal insulin sensitive person, what we see is we see the blue dot over here as a cell and the blood vessel is represented by the space outside of the cell. And a healthy insulin sensitive cell, blood sugar is normal. There's a mixture of sugar and ketones in the bloodstream. And that cell is equally able to use sugar if the sugar concentration goes up a little bit in the bloodstream after a meal or ketones uh, between meals when you're fasting. And that is driven very easily into the cell um, by an insulin sensitive mechanism so that the intracellular and extracellular concentration of sugar is equal. So there's a flat line, a very, very minor gradient between the blood vessels and uh, the intracellular sugar. And we see that on this graph, we see that here as baseline, where you've got extracellular glucose on one arm and intracellular glucose on the other. The um, normal glycemic insulin sensitive person is way at the baseline here. Now, when we look at chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption, genetically, insulin resistance breaks two ways. In the diabetogenic person, where they cannot produce high amounts of insulin, you see the green dots here, which represent insulin, are not significantly elevated, a little bit, but not significantly. So when the cell blocks these receptors, we can no longer force the sugar into the cell. The cell paradoxically is somewhat hypoglycemic, doesn't have enough energy, so it may actually be using some ketones and fat. However, the sugar builds up tremendously on the outside. And in the most severe cases, we see diabetic ketoacidosis, which is where the sugar is built up on the outside, it's not able to be in the cells. Patients are in ketosis, which causes uh, ketoacidosis, uh, because the sugar is high on the outside, but not inside the cells. But this picture is the diabesogenic picture. And we see this on the graph, hyperglycemia. We see the extracellular sugar being high, but the intracellular sugar being low. That's these folks. On the flip side, we see the obesogenic person who can produce massive amounts of insulin. So you see a lot of green dots here, which we can measure in blood work, standard blood work. And that insulin keeps shoving the sugar into the cells. The cells are filled with sugar. The extracellular space has actually normoglycemia. So the, the paradox here is that insulin can actually drive in these folks the sugar up gradient. And the way the cells handle that gradient, especially the fat cells and the liver cells, is they're very effective at converting that sugar through a process called de novo lipogenesis, the new generation of fat. They turn that sugar into fat. And these folks have both intracellular as well as evolving extracellular hyperglycemia. These are what the hyperinsulinemic insulin resistance looks like. So this, these are the two faces of insulin resistance. And most people, even in our space, don't quite understand this. But that's why we're presenting this. Um, so when you look at your patients, when you look at your population, most people are going to look at the fattest person and say, oh my God, they must be sick. But remember that a young fat person, if they can alter that relationship, all of their metabolic disease is fully reversible. And yes, it's seen as weight loss. But really what you're doing there is altering hyperinsulinemic hyper insulin resistance. 
So the most obese people, especially the young ones, are actually the healthiest of the metabolically challenged people. They're carb addicts. They use carbohydrates as a primary source of emotion management. Um, but they have that as an illness. And in fact, I will tell you that the obese woman with, li with lipedema is biologically going to be the healthiest obese person that you can see out there. Lipedema is um, a genetic predisposition based on pro high progesterone levels, where women especially, but men as well, accumulate their fat from their belly buttons down. So their buttocks, their hips, their thighs, you'll see the feet are spared. That's what differentiates it um, from uh, um, a lymp uh, lymphedema, L-O-I-M-P-H. This is L-I-P-E-D-E-M-E-A, where the fat is up here. And that is a historical evolutionary genetic benefit for people that evolved around the equator that they could store fat on the lower half of their body for lean times. And these folks have the healthiest biology, but their fat is extremely stubborn and weight loss is an extremely difficult thing to do. On the flip side, we have these extraordinarily healthy looking athletes. So here you've got a guy, South African chap called Bruce Fordyce, who won the Comrades Marathon, a 90 kilometer ultra distance marathon. He won that nine times. If you look at, Bro uh, at Bruce, skinny, extremely fit man. I mean, this guy runs 90 kilometers uh, in no time at all. Um, and yet Bruce had type two diabetes. Now, you looking at this guy, there's no way on God's earth you're going to say, oh, he's sick. But I would tell you that metabolically, he is sicker and at higher risk of dying of cardiovascular disease of stroke than any of the folks on the obesogenic side. So because of the type 2 diabetes, and where does his type 2 diabetes come from? It comes from the fallacy of carbohydrate loading for exercise performance. And in fact, where was that fostered? If you look at this picture down below here, this again is Bruce winning one of the comrades runs. And in every picture, you'll see the move more. Uh, it's not our sugar sweetened beverages companies. The sugar sweetened beverage companies sponsoring athletes, sponsoring exercise. That's not a coincidence, folks. That's intentional. Diversion. Same thing with Arnold over here. <clears throat> I mean, this guy looks spectacular, but between his steroid use, between that and his diet, the high protein, low sugar, and the protein's just being turned into sugar, um, that caused significant cardiovascular disease. Now, Arnold had a congenital, I believe it was an aortic valve, a bicuspid valve. However, that valve became calcified, became full of plaque, and he nearly died of cardiovascular disease, had to have emergency surgery. So Arnold is not necessarily the healthiest guy, even though he looks that way. And that's the problem with epidemiology. Epidemiology is about looks. It's not about process. So <clears throat> this graph from a friend of mine, David Diamond, who works very heavily in the lipid space, kind of speaks against the cardiac lipid or the lipid heart hypothesis of metabolic disease. And in fact, what's really cool about this slide is that if you look, you've got your obesogenic hyperinsulinemic person over here. And on this side, you've got your hyperglycemic toffee thinner guy here. What's amazing, and if you look at these folks, we talked about this before, cardiovascular disease. The obesogenic person is going to have a very low coronary artery calcium score, whereas the uh, pre-diabetic, diabetic, hyperglycemic person is going to have a very high coronary artery calcium score. That is the trend. But when you look at the LDL and their total cholesterol, there's no difference. There's no difference. So how is it possible that the fattest guy has a high LDL and cholesterol and that skinny hyperglycemic guy also has a high cholesterol about the same? How can fat be responsible for um, causing the coronary artery calcium score elevation? Yes, when you look at the blood vessels, there's fat in there. That's the observational diagnosis. Just looking at Bruce Fordyce and saying Bruce and Arnold are healthy in exactly the same way we look at these blood vessels and say, oh, they're clogged with fat. It must be fat in our diet. That's false. It's the, um, it's the inflammation from sugar. And what are the two corroborating features of that? Here's the most distinctive one, diabetes. 
Diabetes hyperglycemia, the hyperinsulinemic person has a low risk of diabetes until very late, and that is associated or correlated with a low CAC score. On the other hand, the hyperglycemic person has a high diabetic uh, uh, rate of diabetes and the worst score. There's a direct correlation. Hypertension is the other one that does correlate, not quite as, as in detail as, as diabetes. So your obesogenic person is going to have a small amount of plaque, probably related to blood pressure and a little bit to sugar. But these guys are going to have the massive hyperglycemic effect, high CAC score based on a combination of cardiovascular disease, elevated blood pressure, um, uh, neuropathy and arrhythmias, as well as the diabetic plaque effect. And that's an important concept to understand. And to corroborate that, this paper has just been published, 2023, just been published. This is a brilliant paper done by a group of um, Danish, this is from Denmark, Danish physicians who looked at 10-year cardiovascular risk in patients with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. So what they did is they took a group of people with newly diagnosed diabetes as a cohort and studied them for 10 years, and they did a parallel study in a group of people who had not been diagnosed with diabetes. Now, let's just break that down for a second, because type 2 diabetes is diagnosed at an A1C of 6.5. I will tell you that a normal A1C, the data supports a normal A1C as being 5.2 or lower. So therefore, in the so-called normal group, in the control group, you are still going to have people that are mildly hyperglycemic. So they're not going to be immune to disease. They're still going to have a degree of cardiovascular disease, but it's going to be lower than those with proven a proven threshold of an A1C above 6.5. But if you've got an A1C of 6 or 6.1, you're going to fall in the control group, not diagnosed with diabetes, but you are still at risk for cardiovascular disease. So that's the scenario. So we don't have a group, a comparison group, of only people with A1Cs below 5.2. So this is proven diabetic and pre-diabetic. That's kind of the comparison. So uh, just put that out there. And what they looked at <clears throat> was the risk of developing cardiovascular disease over 10 years. And this is serious cardiovascular disease. They looked at heart attack, myocardial infarction. They looked at stroke. And they looked at people who died of cardiovascular disease. Just those three elements. Very serious. And here's the incredible thing, folks. The population that they studied was around 500,000 people. 142,000 um, in the diabetes group and 388,000 in the control group, sex and age match individuals from the general population who did not have diabetes but may have been pre-diabetic. This is astounding. Over 10 years, they measured 52,000 serious heart attack, stroke, death rates. 52,000 out of a population of 500,000. That means that 10% of people over a 10 year period, these are healthy, otherwise normal people, early diagnosis of diabetes, were going to have a serious cardiovascular event, 10% of people in that early group. And that is ridiculously astounding. So 52,000 events were recorded. Um, and here's their consensus. When they compared the general population, the blue lines here, this is women, this is men, when they compared the blue lines over an age period, um, when they compared the general population with the diabetic population, here were the, the most important findings. Compared with the general population, the 10-year cardiovascular risks were higher in patients with type 2 diabetes in both sexes. Again, this corroborates that previous slide I showed you um, looking at the obesogenic versus the diabesogenic people. We're talking about the diabesogenic people. Compared with the general population, the 10-year cardiovascular disease risk were higher in patients with type 2 diabetes in both sexes across all age groups, across all age groups, even if you were young, and especially, especially amongst younger individuals. And in fact, patients aged between 40 and 49 Young, usually fairly healthy people, that category had the largest 10-year cardiovascular risk difference between the diabetics and the general population, whereas 6.1% of 40 to 49-year-olds in the diabetic group developed had a significant cardiovascular event, whereas in the general population, 
that risk was only 3.3%, still significant, but lower. And that's going to be the group that has prediabetes elevated that are, are diabetogenic, but not diabetic. The risk difference between 2.8%, so a significant difference um, <clears throat> of people in 40 to 49, when we should be at some of our healthiest ages. The, um, uh, and that's got a high hazard ratio. The age when a given cardiovascular disease risk was reached. In other words, how soon am I likely to have that heart attack or stroke if I'm diabetic or not diabetic? The age difference, um, when you had a uh, cardiovascular risk substantially differed between the general population and the um, diabetic population. So what they did is, okay, at what age do I have a 5% risk of having a heart attack, a stroke, or, a, or dying of heart disease? When is my risk 5%? And the 10-year cardiovascular risk of 5% was reached at age 43 in men with type 2 diabetes. How often have you, oh, he was so young, he was so fit, but he died of a heart attack. The average age at which diabetics reach a cardiovascular risk of 5% is 43 years of age. Um, and when you compare that with a general population, that happens 12 years later in men at age 55. So if you don't have diabetes, you extend your 5% risk by 12 years. And in women, that is a 10 year, the 10 year CVD risk of 5% was reached a decade later at 51 in women with diabetes, but 61 without diabetes. So essentially what this paper is saying is if we, if we diagnose diabetes or hyperinsulinemia, uh, sorry, hyperglycemia, um, prediabetes early, and we as physicians aggressively manage it, we can impact on these patients, but we need to do it at a very early age in the 20s and 30s to prevent that death happening or that heart attack happening in your 40s or 50s. But at the same time, if you can address or reverse the diabetogenic side, you are going to prolong life. You are going to prolong life by reducing heart attack, stroke, and fatal cardiovascular disease risk by treating that diabetes aggressively. Remember that. That is the take-home message here. And what do we look for? We're obsessed with LDL and cholesterol and lipid numbers, and you must be on a statin. And we, how many physicians out there have ever tested, have ever done a C-peptide, have ever done a um, coronary artery calcium score, have ever looked at an insulin number? How many of you rarely order um, uh, um, uh, hemoglobin A1Cs to evaluate a person's diabetic status? That is far more important when it comes to cardiovascular disease than lipids. So the conclusion from the study is that newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes increases 10-year cardiovascular disease risk across both sexes and all age groups, especially amongst young patients, with cardiovascular disease occurring more than 12 years earlier than in the general population. These are astounding statistics, and it's a really well-conducted study that isn't perfect in this population division. So it's, these numbers are actually skewed to be less severe than the reality. The next comment, uh, the next part that we deciphered from this, and this again is where the pharmaceutical industry has driven a false narrative over the last 40 to 50 years. And that is the statin pharmaceutical industry. And if you look at the statin industry, if you look at something like Crestor, they, complete, they continuously claim a 36% reduction in risk. So let's look at the uh, risks published in this paper. And when you go to this paper, supplemental table um, uh, number 11, they look at cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. And what they did is they looked at the population, they said, okay, who filled, and this is Denmark where they can measure all these things, who filled a prescription for statins? So they looked at the people who filled a, uh, um, a, a prescription for statins and those that did not fill a prescription for statins. Now, I understand that there may be some bias in there, but this group was given statins, this group was not, and they divided that in the general population versus the diabetics. So you're going to have diabetic patients who did and did not take a statin, and then you're going to have the general population who did and did not take a statin. So when we look at the 
age distribution over here. When you look at these numbers over here, difficult to see on this, I would urge you to go back to the original paper, but when you look at the comparison of, uh, which is your relative risk, of um, those that took a statin versus those that didn't, by age and by category for every single group, okay, we had 72,000 people on statins and 70,000 who did not take a statin. And there was no benefit. There was no cardiovascular risk reduction if you took a statin or not. No difference. No difference. And you compare that to all the statin trials that are giving you a 36 to a 46% relative risk reduction. There's no absolute risk reduction. And the word here, the key word here is absolute risk. There is no absolute risk reduction at any population um, in this group from people in their uh, under the age of 40 all the way to over the age of 80. No risk reduction that comes from taking a statin. Now, that's absolute risk. So and when you go back to look at the statin papers, the Jupiter trials and the big trials, you will see. And this is what the pharmaceutical industry has hidden carefully. That even in those papers, those papers aren't different. Even in those papers, the absolute risk difference isn't statistically significant. It's less than 1%. So the absolute benefit of taking a statin is less than 1% on cardiovascular risk. Now, if you look at that previous slide, you see what that cardiovascular risk is. Okay? So statins do not provide a risk reduction, and this paper corroborates that. Secondly, uh, when you look at those that took statins versus those that didn't. And this is what the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry did. They did something called a relative risk. So if less than 1% of people died who took a statin or didn't take a statin, they took the fraction that died on the statin group and the non-statin group, and they compared those two. And that's where their 36% difference came in. Well, we can stratify a less robust but a similar uh, um, associated relative risk from some of this data. However, however, even when you look at relative risk by age category, while there was no significant difference in 10-year cardiovascular disease uh, rates between statin users and non-statin users, if you are a woman under 40 or a male over 80, and several in between come close to this, there is actually a 2.5 times increased risk, and this is bizarre, a 2.5 times increased risk of cardiovascular disease in that population that took statins. Now, it may be that they were the sicker population, that's why they were given the statins in the first place. But there's no way on God's earth that statins, if the pharmaceutical correct, uh, companies are correct, that statins should either not have an effect, a beneficial effect, which this study amply demonstrates, and it doesn't matter what your cardiovascular risk is, or that it actually makes your risk worse. So, so think about that for a few minutes, folks. And next time you prescribe a statin, ask yourself, what the devil are you doing? Because clearly the obesogenic people who have a low CAC score don't need that statin, and yet you're prescribing it like it's candy. And in this group, you're prescribing a drug that is not helping them, and you are not measuring nor treating the diabetes that causes the problem. So, okay, having said all of that about the shift and metabolic health is more about insulin resistance and understanding and managing insulin resistance as a disease reversal than lipid heart. We've debunked that. Let's look now at therapy that we use. And we're going to look at sequential multimodal treatment that is the foundation of my practice. And we look at obesity more as a substance abuse disorder. We look at insulin resistance, the cause of insulin resistance being more a substance abuse problem than a nutrition problem. In a similar way that alcoholism is not a hydration problem. It's a substance abuse problem. Alcohol is a liquid, but it's not something we drink for hydration. Carbohydrates is something in our food system, but it's not primarily used by the insulin resistant population for its nutritional value. It's used for its emotion management value. So in our practice, the um, <clears throat> single most important primary 
uh, intervention is a sustainable for sustainability of effect is a lifestyle intervention changing how the patient manages their mental health away from using eating and drinking as a primary resource to using other resources and so the lifestyle interventions are there to sustainably treat insulin resistance by treating the root cause which is dysfunctional emotion management as part of that on a pragmatic level there is a dietary component and we call that therapeutic carbohydrate reduction so if you can help these folks to radically reduce their carbohydrate consumption um, and probably part of that is caloric reduction but we see an improvement in insulin resistance with a byproduct of improving metabolic health so a low carbohydrate healthy fat diet is the order of the day in this program and the reason we speak about high fat or healthy fat is because the dominant source of calories for these folks uh, when they're insulin resistant is carbohydrates when you reduce the carbohydrates it's very difficult to increase your protein consumption to accommodate for the carbohydrate loss but what we do is we replace the carbohydrates with healthy fat and we have demonstrated over and over and the preceding data demonstrates that fat is not the problem that it's carbohydrates and um, secondly if we need help so this is the foundational treatment we also add in cognitive behavioral modi modification therapy a change in the mechanism by which you manage your mental health we use substance abuse psychology uh, in our practice to manage these patients so you've got me the doctor you've got our um, certified diabetic educated dietitian and we've got our psychologist our prescribing psychologist who is the foundation of our practice in metabolic health now as a physician there are some people that need help either they're particularly brittly sick and they need an acceleration of the treatment of insulin resistance or they're struggling and they don't they struggle with the capacity to sustainably make these behavioral changes we can then as part of a sequential multimodal therapy add in medications to treat insulin resistance but the goal of the medication is to treat the insulin resistance not to lose weight okay a lot of these medications are prescribed by endocrinologists to lose weight or treat diabetes mm -mm. we use it to treat insulin resistance and as a final sequential multimodal therapy we may then add in on top of the sequence bariatric devices like balloons or bariatric surgery to help these patients in a continuum of sustainable change so let's explore that <clears throat> again the way we look at this and this is the metabolic health specialist's way of looking at insulin resistance from a physiologically thinking pathway the physiology is that a high carbohydrate diet is a form of emotional instant gratification that defines the diet this is not a nutrition problem it's a substance abuse problem along with snacking and binge eating and that there is the cause over time of insulin resistance whether that insulin resistance that is hyperglycemic or hyperinsulinemic because the hyperglycemic versus hyperinsulinemic spectrum just determines what types of metabolic diseases you're going to develop but ultimately it is chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption carbohydrate addiction that drives the ir genetically your ir is going to be expressed as we said in that earlier slide in different forms but ir is the disease we treat and therapeutic carbohydrate reduction plus what i call chess uh, creative arts um, healthy human connections exercise healthy sleep uh, healthy sexuality um, spirituality and meditation are the foundation of an effort-based self-care system to replace carbohydrates as a source of emotion management as a way of life that's where your sustainability comes along a lot of people working in our space don't have an algorithm don't have a, have a specific treatment module and a plan of action for sustainability there's our plan that's the summary of our sustainability and as you do this as you reduce carbohydrates and as you develop an effort-based self-care that restores over time insulin sensitivity and in our practice it takes around two years it takes around two years to fully of continuous uh, uh, change to restore insulin sensitivity to treat the obesity to treat the diabetes and obesity should not be here on the on the um 
limb of the on the on the trunk of the tree it is one of the limbs obesity is one of a myriad of metabolic diseases and treating insulin resistance reverses metabolic disease so our focus is nutritional behavioral therapy incretin medications and using bariatric surgery not as a an endpoint but as a tool along a journey and to my mind that's smart thinking so this is what the GLP ones do, and everybody's heard of them. This is the Ozempics, the Wegovies. We've used them for a long time for diabetes management, as Victoza, Bayetta, Bidurion, several of them on the market, a huge competitive pharmaceutical market, and this is how they're being marketed. But the GLP ones, a lot of people look at the damaging side effects, and when you use GLP ones as monotherapy, and people haven't changed their relationship with carbohydrates, of course they're going to have fallout. Of course, they're going to have bad side effects. They're going to have muscle wasting because they're not eating adequate protein. They're going to have GI upset because that's what it does. So, but the benefits of GLP-1 agonists mediated by the GLP-1 itself or mediated by insulin, higher insulin levels and lower glyco uh, glucagon in, that's what GLP-1 does, low, increases insulin, lowers glucagon, increases beta cell proliferation, beta, uh, decreases beta cell apoptosis, so it improves diabetic function and converts you from being a little bit more diabesogenic to a little bit more obesogenic, but because it suppresses appetite through delayed in gastric emptying as well as a uh, an appetite suppression directly in the hypothalamus of the brain, it has a myriad of effects that treat uh, uh, metabolic disease. But the problem is everybody's being written a script for these GLP-1s because the epidemiologists are seeing the benefit of weight loss and diabetes reduction. And it's being done as monotherapy. So it may work a little bit, a little while, but it's a powerful medication. You may have damaging side effects if you don't treat it properly. And the sustainability of the effect is absent. The sustainability is absent. So in my opinion, for sustainability, a patient being put on the GLP-1 must, must be in a metabolic, uh, must see a metabolic physician in a supervised program, must be on a ketogenic, low carbohydrate, higher healthy fat diet, must find forms of physical activity to their own capacity, no matter how limited they are, must be monitored with diabesogenic blood work must monitor their blood sugar and their, key, and their ketones, whether they are using a keto mojo or a continuous glucose monitor, must be engaged in cognitive behavioral therapy for sustainability and must be part of a metabolic, uh, multimodal metabolic health program. Those are the musts if you're gonna prescribe a GLP-1 and that's where Global Health Quest comes in. Let's look now at the final part, bariatric surgery. And what bariatric surgery does is it has two effects. It is all about caloric reduction, no matter what they say. So when you have bariatric surgery, the first most benign option is to temporarily place a balloon in the stomach. And what the balloon does is it's a space occupying device. So your stomach is already pre-filled and therefore you require less food by quantity no matter what you're eating, to fill the stomach, and that is your caloric reduction, and you have benefits, uh, the epidemiology says so. The second thing that the balloon does, it doesn't actually sit higher up here in the stomach, it sits here in the prepyloric space, partially blocks the outlet of the stomach, so not only do you eat less food to fill the stomach, you also eat less often because this food is retained in the stomach. There's a direct consequence of delayed gastric emptying mediated by the balloon that is far more serious and severe than what the GLP-1s do. But everyone complains of the GLP-1 gastroparesis. Well, the surgeries do exactly the same thing. Here you've got a lap band, exactly the same principle. These are primary restrictive operations where a band around the stomach gets you to fill this small pouch instead of this big pouch. Food sits here for a long time, you feel full and you lose weight. Sleeve gastrectomy is another version of that, the one that I like the most. None of these are metabolically significantly active. They, you, you keep what you eat, so there's not a lot of malabsorption that you see down the road. So if you eat it, you get it. And it's important to counsel these patients to eat food that has nutritional value. With a sleeve, you remove the bulky uh, part of the stomach, so you convert this bag into a tube, you eat a small amount of food, goes through very slowly, and you feel full the best restriction operation out there. And I like this sleeve a lot. It is a permanent surgery. These two are reversible. 
the gastric bypass and the um, single anastomosis duodenal interposition or the duodenal switch are two surgeries that are far more aggressive, far more radical, and they combine restriction, the SADE with a sleeve gastrectomy, the gastric bypass with a small pouch disconnecting the lower part of the stomach, and then they also reroute the intestine so that your food goes down one arm and the enzymes that break your food down go down the other arm and the two only mix very, very late. So the way I look at, the, the way I describe a duodenal switch or a SADE operation is basically you are sewing your mouth to your butt and you can eat whatever you want to and you poop it all out. The problem with these people, these are the most, the concern with this or the good part about this, these are the people that lose the most radical amount of weight because they're not eating as much and they're pooping the majority of that out. So they lose weight by uh, pooping the food out and not eating a lot. However, the same applies to their micronutrients and their macronutrients. So while they lose weight very radically, which is what everyone buys into, I just want to lose the weight, I just want to lose the weight. And those are the patients coming in frustrated with their lack of ability to lose weight and they want the magic bullet. But what they don't think about is where am I going to be at five years, 10 years, 20 years? How does that malabsorption and that restriction affect me? And these people all trade in the disease of obesity for the disease of malnutrition. And I do not, for the most part, favor either of these two operations that have become increasingly popular on the epidemiologically based bariatric surgery uh, slate. I favor the pure restrictive sleeve gastrectomy or going backwards on this pathway rather than going this way because we engage in multimodal therapy. Now, let's look at the effects of these operations. And this is what the bariatric surgeons are going to tout both physiologic and behavioral changes affected by these three surgeries. So you've got your gastric bypass duodenal switch, you've got your sleeve gastrectomy and the lap band. And the first thing we see, the most important thing is caloric reduction, calories out. And as they get, get leaner, they're able to exercise a little bit more. So calories are reduction in caloric consumption, increase in exercise. There is a change to the hedonistic response of high calorie foods or high carbohydrate foods with the bypasses, with the malabsorptive operations. So that's a benefit. Uh, you don't see that quite as much with the sleeve. You see some, but not a lot with the others. You see on a therape therapeutic carbohydrate reduced diet, these folks have to eat a lot of protein and a lot of fat, and often they don't but there is an automatic decrease in carbohydrates. With a sleeve gastrectomy, one of the reasons I like it is animal products are your easiest food to eat. So you migrate automatically more to an, a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, whereas the lap band and the balloon struggle with red meat consumption, certainly the lap bands, and struggle with fibrous vegetables. So they tend to migrate back to carbohydrates very, very easily. Um, food aversions are implemented by the surgeries through dumping syndrome. So both the bypass and the sleeve gastrectomies have dumping syndrome, whereas the bands don't have dumping syndrome. Um, they have a problem with eating chunky food. So they migrate more to sloppy foods, which is carbohydrate rich. So the food preference for bypass, if they're going to fail, are the starches, the toasts, the pastas, the rices. Same with the sleeve gastrectomies, whereas the lap band people favor the sweeter ones, the ice creams, the chocolates, those that dissolve and become sloppy. Um, the training for these patients to have multiple small meals a day, which retards the reversal of insulin resistance, whereas the sleeve gastrectomy, we get them to eat once or twice or three times a day. The lap band patients often graze, and that's not a good idea. We talked about dumping. The other issue with the um, bypass type operations is in the defunctioned limb. They develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So they do develop SIBO. And that is a concern because that biome, a lot of focus on the biome, the biome is disrupted in these operations, whereas in the sleeve gastrectomy and the lap band or balloon, there's no change to the biome. The GLP-1s and incretins are automatically elevated in the bypass. So for early on, um, you feel less hungry, uh, less so with the sleeve and not so with the, with the band. So there is a early GLP-1 incretin GIP effect and hormones you're going to hear about down the road, amylin and peptide YY, which have a lot of interest uh, in the pharmaceutical company. The, uh, the leptin and the ghrelin stuff, that's come and gone because it hasn't been found to be of value significantly in this process, but the incretin and these other um, appetite suppression hormones are developing a lot of interest. And yes, 
in the bypass patients, they see a transient effect and that accelerates the weight loss. We see the same with the sleeve gastrectomy. We do not see it with a band. So there are ancillary behavioral and physiologic changes, but these are transient and temporary. So the weight loss with bariatric surgery is significant in the first two years or so. Then it levels off. And then the question is, did you change your behavior pattern significantly to sustain the weight loss? And the answer is that 85% of people don't and they regain the weight. Now, this is the most important slide for me that defines what I do for a living. So in an epidemiologic setting, there's a group of folks led by Phil Shower, the Stampede investigators, they're all bariatric surgeons, and they were trying to establish additional benefits for bariatric surgery and metabolic health. So they said, okay, we know that bariatric surgery creates a substantially significantly improved weight loss in obese patients. But we also see vicariously a reversal of diabetes. So what happens if we use bariatric surgery in a mildly overweight population, not the enormous patients, the diabetogenic patients, to reduce diabetes risk? And that's what they did. So they compared with these studies, they compared, and these are the black lines that I'm going to break down, they compared um, medical therapy, diet and exercise, calories in, calories out, over five year, a five-year period with bariatric surgery, and they looked at weight loss and they looked at improvement in hemoglobin A1C because of that. I've additionally added to this graph two things. I've added to the graph the monotherapy results from the um, STEP trial. The STEP trials were done for ozempic weight loss. So we added the STEP trial data here, and then we're also going to look at data from my practice, which is a metabolic, a multimodal metabolic management practice. So <clears throat> when you look at medical therapy um, for weight loss, the average BMI drop from start to five years is a BMI of 36 down to a BMI of 34. So really not significant weight loss, a small amount of weight loss, but really not that much. And I can tell you over time uh, that increases, but even five years out, that number is probably a little bit generous in, in most people. When you look at um, the role of incretins, the role of GLP-1, they lose a significant amount of weight in the first year while they're on the medication. But as they come off the medication or the medication stops working, so-called stops working, they start to gain their weight back. And the long-term effect after about two years is no different than not using the medication at all. So no statistical significance there in terms of change of baseline by weight. When you look at surgery, when you look at sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass, they're about the same, similar, bypass being a little bit better than, than sleeve in terms of weight loss, but we see a significant drop in weight. We see a BMI change from around 36 to 37 down to 28, 29, still overweight, but a dramatic change in weight that is sustainable, although you start to see the increase. And I can tell you that when you take this out to 10 years, about 85% of these patients have gained their weight back. And now I'm going to show you data from my practice. And remember, all of these patients in this group had surgery. This group did not have surgery. In my practice, for my obesogenic patients, about 60% of them had surgery. About 40% were managed behaviorally or on GLP-1s. And in this group, our starting BMI was a little higher, 41. But with the surgery and without the surgery, a lot of our patients, 40% of our patients, were able to be successful without surgery. And these patients dropped a significantly larger amount of weight than the surgical group, the pure calories in, calories out, exercise more group, and were able to sustain that weight loss. Look at the difference. Significant P is less than 0 0.001 difference from the surgical group, let alone the conservative group. So our um, group went from a BMI of 41.3 down to a sustainable BMI at five years of 27. Significant improvement in weight loss. And that is not necessarily with surgery. Some of them had surgery, some did not. Now, let's look at what happened with diabetes. So when you treat patients with the standard diabetic regimen, um, a some form of 
carbohydrate-rich diets and, and a bunch of medications, the medical therapy shows a decrease in A1C and then a progressive rise. But with medical therapy, the average A1C went from 8.8 .8 to 8.5. Really no significant difference over five years. With the, with the um, GLP-1 medications, we see an initial drop and then a slow recidivism, even in the diabetic patients where the GLP-1s become less effective and we see no statistical difference with GLP-1 medications at five years. So that's problematic. And this is the issue with the current medical endocrinology um, glycemic index approach, which is the dietary approach, glycemic index approach, even with medications. And the diabetic endocrinologists are happy with an A1C below seven. Our target is 5.2, folks. 5.2 is no disease. So 7 is a problem. And even if you drop it below 7, that's a problem. Because remember, diabetes is diagnosed at 6.5 A1C. So why do we set 7 as that threshold of below 7, kumbaya, you're healthy? It doesn't work that way. This uh, uh, full showers group, the Stampede trial, then looked at the surgery, bypass and sleeve, and they were very similar, no statistical difference, bypass and sleeve in terms of reduction in A1C and the sustainability. And these folks went from an average uh, um, A1C of about 9.4 starting, so a little higher than the medical therapy group, but they ended up with an A1C of around 7.4. So a little bit better than the, than the glycemic index medication group, but a one point difference in A1C. Yes, it's but it's good, but you've still got an A1C at five years above seven. You're still profoundly diabetic. You're still at significant risk for cardiovascular disease. If you look at the data I presented earlier on. Now you look at our practice, and this is important. We do not do, we do not do bariatric surgery in our diabetogenic population. We reserve that for the obesogenic patients, whether they have diabetes or not. So 100% of the patients in this graph, and it represents 1,000 patients. This is 1,000 patients for my practice. This N is higher than all of these Ns. These Ns were much, much lower. This represents 1,000 patients followed for five years or longer, starting out with an A1C, an average A1C of 8.9%, of, uh, so a little lower than the bypass sleeve population, 8.9%. And we saw over time using multimodal therapy, but not surgery. So this is lifestyle intervention, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, behavioral change, and GLP-1 medications. We saw a drop from 8.9%, sustainable down to 5.4%, lower than the average general population. Lower than the average general population. An A1C of 5.4% in this population group. And that is sustainable out to five years. And this, folks, is what a metabolic health specialist can target that general therapy, endocrinology therapy, and bariatric surgery cannot do. So when you look at my friend Archie, and, and Archie over here is just an anecdote of those uh, patients. Now, Archie is clearly obesogenic. When Archie was 16 years old, his BMI was 86.7. He was a big boy. Okay. And yes, we did the full multimodal workup. Archie's already begun. You can see him eating a piece of bacon, but still enormous over here, pre-surgery. So we, we use surgery. We use GLP-1s for 120 days, just for four months, and then discontinue them to initiate the process. And then he had a sleeve gastrectomy. And three years later, this is Archie, going from a BMI of 86.7 down to 33.9. And I can tell you now, Archie's BMI five years out is 27. Archie's BMI is 27 right now. He's five years out, okay? Um, his triglyceride numbers dropped from 766 to 94. His LDL uh, went up. Oh my God, his LDL went up. I'm totally fine with that. Look at the difference in him. So why are you afraid of an LDL going up? His LDL went up from 87 to 212. Totally happy with that. By the way, his CAC score is zero. Coronary artery calcium score is zero. So this LDL number, and he's young, but this LDL number has not caused any cardiovascular risk for him. He's, diabetes, he's obesogenic, but he crossed over. How, did, how do we know he crossed over? Here's his A1C. His A1C was 6.7. Diabetic, type 2 diabetes, when he was obese. But he's obesogenic. He became fat first and then flipped across to diabetes when he became 
insulin resistant to the point that he could not produce more insulin to overcome that. So we saw the drop in A1C from 6.7 to 5.5. 5.5 is way better than any of those bariatric surgery results uh, that the other group, the Stampede group, have, have defined. And currently, Archie's A1C, five years out, is 5.1. So it's improved over the course of five years. Fasting blood sugar is, went from 166 on average to 88. But look at this, folks. <clears throat> Look at his fasting insulin. This is what makes him obesogenic. He had a C-peptide of 5.34 and a fasting insulin level of 47 when he was fat. And that dropped down to become insulin sensitive or very close to that. Three years out, he was at 7.9 and 2.1. And now Archie runs an, a C-peptide of around 1 to 1.5 and an insulin level typically below 6. So he has now become insulin sensitive. Took time. Home IR, same difference. This, by the way, folks, is our metabolic blood work panel. I'm not going to go through it all, but these are all the parameters that we look at for metabolic health. Most folks never order most of these studies and certainly don't know how to interpret them. So when we look at my patient population, my patient population is somewhat unique, and I call my patient population a group of experts at failing weight loss programs. Because all their previous programs were calories in, calories out. They'd lose weight, they'd gain it back. They were yo-yoing like crazy because they never treated root cause. So the context of the comparison of weight loss versus an obesity management program is that obesity is a chronic disease that is very difficult to manage in a sustainable man manner without multimodal therapy. So single interventions, medication, surgery, even diet are not going to sustainably make a change. In our practice, we use four sequential therapeutic strategies. We start with an educational program uh, and we begin with our diet to change, to make a nutritional modification. Progressively over time, we introduce the concept and the practice of therapeutic carbohydrate re reduction and, um, and, and um, we change the snacking behavior and we change the um, portion control site. So we, we deal with the dietary changes. We then also simultaneously begin to manage cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, we help the patients, the successful patients are going to slowly over time make a, prior, a change to their primary form of emotion management by adopting and incorporating creative arts, healthy human connection, uh, exercise, physical activity, spirituality, meditation, healthy sleep and healthy sexuality as a foundation of emotion management. That is the substance abuse program, that's carb addiction. So that is our baseline. We then in some patients add pharmacotherapy and incretins, the GLP-1s and the combination drugs are our primary focus there in terms of treating insulin resistance, but we only do that for the first 120 days three to four to five to six months at most, because over time, if the patient doesn't make a change, the, the medications are not gonna do it by themselves. And then there is a selective group of patients for whom we are going to use bariatric surgical interventions, balloons, bands, and the sleeve gastrectomy is my favorite. Now, what's the evidence for this? Well, as we saw after two years of lifestyle intervention, weight loss is approximately 5% of body weight. And it regains after that by five, 10 years, there's really no, no significant effect. In our program, as you saw, that lifestyle intervention, this is calories in, calories out. That's the standard stuff. In our intervention, it is dramatically greater than that, as you've seen from the previous slide. Um, when you look at the step four data, the mo this is monotherapy of a diet. Monotherapy of Ozempic, when you look at the step four trial data, the patients in that trial lost 10.6% of body weight on Ozempic. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you're going to lose 20 pounds, just over 20 pounds um, while you're on Ozempic. Great, wonderful, great intervention. But then if you don't change your behavior, in the group that was switched uh, to a placebo at, uh, um, uh, at the end of, a, I think it was a year or 18 months, and they were tracked for another 48 weeks, less than a year, Already in less than a year, that group that lost around 10% of their body weight gained back around 
of the body weight that they lost. So if you lost 20 pounds on Ozempic, within 48 weeks, less than a year, you've gained back 14 of those pounds. And that is highly problematic. And certainly by a year, two years out, that weight gain is excessive. It's beyond where you started out. With bariatric surgery, the evidence is that um, by one year, the majority of patients have lost over 50% of their um, excess uh, body weight. So they've lost a huge amount of weight. The problem though, folks, is by 10 years, 85% treated with bariatric surgery as an endpoint tool, over 85% of those patients have regained some of their weight back. And the problem is that all of these interventions that are based on the premise that weight loss solves um, metabolic health, all of them are played by weight regain. And while we do see an improvement in the uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular and metabolic effects, these effects are only transient while the patients have lost the weight. But when they regain it, all of these diseases come flooding back, but are often not noticed until very late. So the focus for a metabolic health program, the sustainability comes from the treatment and the conversion of insulin resistance to insulin sensitivity. The focus of a metabolic health program is to restore insulin sensitivity, and this is best managed by a multidisciplinary clinical team using multimodal strategy that integrates nutritional change, pharmacotherapy, psychologic behavioral therapy, and potentially bariatric surgery. And the problem currently, folks, is that while this should be covered by healthcare insurance, it is not. And one of the challenges I have as a bariatric specialist, as a metabolic specialist, is that my services are often not covered by health insurance, which is ludicrous because they'll pay for the treatment of your heart attack, but they won't pay for the prevention of that heart attack. Crazy. And as we mentioned, bariatric surgery may be a key component to the management of obesity in selected patients. Don't discount that. These are the benefits. These are my patients. And these are patients that are years and years out. So we see over time in a multimodal therapeutic program, including bariatric surgery, we see dramatic improvement in multiple of these, but it's the sustainability that's the issue. So given the data that I've produced so far, and given that Danish study, given our understanding of the carbohydrate insulin model of insulin resistance, obesity, and diabetes, versus the lipid heart model, I'm going to make this brave statement that statin therapy and the lipid heart hypothesis as a primary driver of cardiovascular care is likely to become obsolete within the next one to two years, particularly with the advent of the insulin resistant treatment medications, the incretins, the GLP-1s, and their lookalikes. So in conclusion, we need to understand that human metabolism is always physiologically driven and that pathway, if you open your eyes, can be very easily seen and both physiologically and pathophysiologically patho understood. You cannot be obese without insulin resistance. And insulin resistance requires carbohydrate abuse, carbohydrate addiction, not excess calories. It is carbohydrates that cause insulin resistance, period. The genetic hormonal response to chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption determines whether the phenotypic expression of that genotype when you eat carbohydrates is either obesogenic with allied metabolic health issues or dibesogenic with cardiovascular risks. Metabolic disease depends the type of disease that you develop metabolically depends on when hyperinsulinemia peaks. Everybody that becomes diabetic, type 2, everybody that becomes obese has hyperinsulinemia, but the obesogenic group has massive hyperinsulinemia. The diabesogenic group has modest failed hyperinsulinemia. In other words, their insulin cannot protect them from sugar building up in the bloodstream. So it's a failure of adequate insulin provision. Bariatric surgery results in weight loss, but does not treat the cause of obesity. So therefore, bariatric surgery and the incretins are a tool, not an endpoint. And that is a fundamental difference between a metabolic practice and the general endocrinology, general practitioner practice that puts people on medication or does surgery. 
Treating insulin resistance by multimodal therapy treats the root cause of metabolic disease and a fat adapted insulin sensitivity state is the healthiest hormonal state and is the proper human metabolic state. This is what metabolic physicians like myself strive to achieve in our patients. I want to thank you. I know this has been a detailed, long discussion, but my job today was to make you think. You can disagree with me, you can argue with me, but we really don't need to take ourselves that seriously because none of us has a monopoly on wisdom and we are learning more every day. However, when we are wrong, when we do fall down and we do make mistakes, we need to rise up and recognize that we've made those mistakes. We need to rise up when we fall and not stay bogged down in our mistakes. The longer we cling on to our mistakes, hoping that they are not, the worse we get in healthcare. I am Dr. Robert Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you'd like an appointment, um, text, call, or WhatsApp us to 561-627-4107, um, and we will help you along this pathway. We'll engage you in a metabolic health uh, plan. We will do the robust metabolic health work. We'll get a CAC score if warranted, and we will engage you with our, keto, uh, 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 our ketogenic diabetic dietitian as well as our psychologist. That is our plan. That is our program. That is what we're trying to build. Thank you so much.